In the voice of Russia World Service, welcome to another edition of the Christian Message from Moscow. We are dedicating it to Lent. Today you shall hear a story by clergyman Nikolai Agafonov by the rivers of Babylon. The events described in the story are taken from real life. This was in the 1920s, in the first years of Soviet rule. An emergency meeting was underway at the Gubernia Bolshevist Committee. They were discussing the recent directive of the government on the withdrawal of religious valuables. Speaking was Ivan Isaevich Sadomsky, the first secretary of the Gubernia Party Committee. All those present listened closely, for they fully appreciated the importance of the issue for the strengthening of Bolshevist power in the young Soviet Republic. Ivan Isaevich was an old Bolshevik, a comrade of Vladimir Lenin. Years of exile, prisons and subversive activity had hardened the character of this stalwart revolutionary. He spoke in brief phrases that were like whiplashes. The party demands resolute actions from us. From an ideological aspect, the church is our principal enemy. The country is in ruins. The Volga region is in the grips of famine. We must use to advantage this situation in our fight with the monks and priests. They must be stamped out as a breed, once and for all. In the name of world revolution, they must be relentlessly exterminated. The withdrawal of church valuables ought to generate their resistance. Vladimir Ilyich Lenin demands that we rush to profit from this, executing as many bishops and clergymen and monks as possible. We might not have another opportunity. We need to discuss our plan for putting this directive into practice in our region. What are your suggestions? Comrades, please be brief and to the point. Member of the Gubernia Committee Pyotr Yevdekimovich Svirnikov took the floor. Comrades, I would like to inform you that Mother Superior Yefresinia of the Women's Convent has already paid us a visit offering to help the hunger-stricken population of the Volga region. She is prepared to donate all the convent valuables, with the exception of the holy vessels. She said there would be a public prayer at the convent on Sunday, and she would personally remove the priceless casing from the Tichvin icon of the Mother of God, to pass it on to the fund for the aid of the starving population. She was prepared to explain to the people that this icon would lose none of its miraculous power without this casing, since in olden times there were no silver or gold icons at all. After this speech a ruckus broke out, with many jumping to their feet. There were shouts, What a crafty witch! So she plans to boost the reputation of the church by offering to help the starving folk. 
Comrades, shouted others. Why, this is ideological terror on the part of the church. Stop this noise, thundered Sadomsky. We continue the meeting of the Gubernia Committee. Next to take the floor is chairman of the Gubernia Extraordinary Commission, Comrade Tverdikovsky Lev Gavrilovich. We shall not put up with any ideological terror on the part of the church, said Tverdikovsky. Any terror shall in turn be eliminated by our ruthless red terror. In this situation we need to deal a preventive blow. On Sunday we shall enter the cathedral and begin to withdraw church valuables right during the service. This should provoke those in the church to show some resistance. Then we will be able to arrest the Mother Superior for organizing a counter-revolutionary revolt and sabotaging the decree of the Soviet authorities, and shall follow up with a complete withdrawal of all church property. Mother Euphrosinia, accompanied by two sisters, was making her way towards the convent cathedral for the divine liturgy. Outwardly it seemed as if this elderly, slightly plump woman, the mother superior of a large convent in the very heart of the city, was walking with a proud, even haughty air. However, this was a deceptive manner. In actual fact, she found great difficulty in taking every step. Her arthritis riddled, swollen feet caused her tremendous pain, so that she grimaced at every step. However, she did her utmost to conceal this. Even as she made her way to the service, she couldn't shake off the gloomy thoughts that assailed her. The brutal murder of Metropolitan Vladimir of Kiev, and rumors of monasteries being desecrated and clergymen killed, struck fear in her that soon they would suffer a similar fate. All night long she prayed before the icon of the Mother of God of Tsikhvin that they might be spared. She slipped into a slumber when it was near dawnbreak, and in her sleep a vision came to her. The angels descend from the heavens to their convent and hold wreaths in their hands. She began counting the angels. Suddenly, an elder approached and said, Do not bother counting, Mother Superior. It's all been counted. There are 108 wreaths. Upon waking, she realized that a martyr's death awaited all the sisters. No, not all, the Mother Superior suddenly roused herself, there are 109 sisters at the convent, while there were 108 wreaths. This means someone will escape death. So be it. The Lord's will be done, said Mother Euphrosinia, making the sign of the cross and entering the cathedral. During the singing of the cherubic hymn, the Mother Superior started weeping. The choir was singing particularly movingly that day. The sweet female voices soared up towards the vaulted dome of the cathedral, showering down gracious sparks on all those gathered and firing their hearts with prayer and penitence. cherubic hymn was over, the Mother Superior heard some noise outside the cathedral. Go and see what it is, sister, she addressed the nun Fyodora, the vestry clerk.
The nun returned pale and with trembling voice said, Mother Superior, there are armed people there attempting to enter the cathedral. They say they've come to withdraw all church valuables. But our parish menfolk refuse to let them pass. That is why there is such a ruckus. What should we do? At that moment, the archdeacon at the Ambo was saying, All catechumens depart. Depart, catechumens. Mother Superior straightened, and anger flashed in her eyes. Do you hear, Mother Fiadora, what the archdeacon is proclaiming? The infidels must leave the church. But, Mother Superior, they seem very determined. They will refuse to leave, I fear, remonstrated Fiadora. I am also determined. If they refuse to go of their free will, I shall give my blessing for them to be thrown out and the doors barred till the end of the divine liturgy. Some time later, an even louder noise came from the entrance. There were sounds of a struggle and a gunshot. The huge metal doors of the cathedral slowly but surely started to swing together. The bolt clanked, and our muffled cries came from outside the cathedral. The archdeacon proclaimed, Let us stand aright, let us stand with fear, let us attend that we may offer the holy oblation in peace. A reverential silence was immediately reinstated in the cathedral. The anaphora began. Before the beginning of the Holy Communion, the Mother Superior instructed that all sisters of the convent take communion on this occasion. But Mother, many of us did not prepare for this. Mother Fiadora attempted to remonstrate. I shall take all the responsibility for this, said Mother Yefrasinia briefly. Towards the end of the service, they started hammering at the doors with rifle butts. Maybe we should go get some dynamite and just blow the doors to all hell, suggested some half-drunk sailor with a black eye and a cap askew. However, at that moment, the doors of the cathedral opened. Mother Superior stood there, with the sisters crowding behind her. Mother Euphrasinia's face wore a tranquil expression, her clear eyes gazing with sorrow and regret at the Red Army men standing at the parvis. Then she took a step, struck her superior's staff against the cathedral flagstone. Now her expression shone with conviction, and the people crowding at the parvis unwittingly stood aside. Tvertikovsky was waiting for her below. By decision of the Gubane Party Committee, your convent is shut down for insubordination and open resistance to Soviet decrees. All the church valuables are to pass into the hands of the workers and peasants. The instigators of the resistance are under arrest. After calmly hearing this out, the Mother Superior said... Our weapons are prayer and the Holy Cross. I alone am the instigator. No one else is to blame. We shall see, said Tverdikovsky curtly. 
Take away the arrested. Mother Euphrosyne turned and bowed low. Forgive me, sisters, for being strict with you. We shall soon meet again. Pray, and have faith. There were exclamations and muffled sobs from the sisters. Mother Fiodora resolutely stepped from the crowd, and also bowed before the sisters. Forgive me too, for I shall go with Mother Superior. The soldier convoy glanced questioningly at Tverdikovsky. Should we take this one too? Arrest her, brothers! Shouted the sailor with a bruised eye. She was the one who gave the orders when they shoved us out of the cathedral, and she personally jabbed at me with something heavy. When the nuns were being led to the cart to take them to prison, Mother Superior asked the vestry clerk. So, Mother Fiodora, what is it you hit him with? The latter blushed and said, "Oh, just the first thing I laid hands on." And what exactly did you lay hands on? The Mother Superior pressed on. Our church seal, it's so heavy. So you branded the Antichrist, did you? Smiled the nun. The convoy soldiers exchanged surprised glances upon seeing the smiling nuns. After the convent was shut down, all the nuns were sent away. However, the sisters didn't want to go far, so they found refuge at homes of nearby parishioners. They all had faith that the convent would soon be reopened, and Mother Superior would return. Soon, to their joy, they saw a notice on the gates of the convent, saying that all nuns willing to return to the place were to gather at a certain time for a meeting. On the appointed day, the radiant sisters gathered at the convent. The only ones missing were the Mother Superior and the Vestry Clerk. Plus a young novice, they all gathered at the refectory. Tverdikovsky came in. I welcome you all, comrade nuns. Soviet power has decided to return the convent to you, but you in turn must help us. You must go to a certain village and help gathering the harvest there. You must understand, it's civil war. There aren't enough hands in the field. So. Do you agree? The sisters echoed joyously as one. Of course we agree. All we want is to get our convent back and to serve the Lord. Good," said Tverdikovsky. "This evening the drays will come. We shall set off for the quay, and then take a barge along the river to the village. Don't go away, anyone." When the sisters descended to the hold of the barge, the soldiers immediately barred the doors after them. The sisters saw two women in the corner. One of them was lying on the straw, moaning. Her head lay in the lap of the other woman. "Who are you?" asked one of the nuns. "I am your mother superior, dear sisters." With cries of joy, the sisters rushed to the two women. Quiet, Mother Fiodora is dying. At that instant, the barge trembled, and drawn by the tug, moved upstream along the river. The bright glow of the moon shone on the sisters through the crevices in the deck. They suddenly saw the empty eye pits of the Mother Superior. She was blind, and they burst out weeping. Stop, sisters! This is a time for prayer, not weeping. 
Heeding the imperious voice of the Mother Superior, the sisters ceased crying. Are all the sisters of the convent here? asked Mother Euphrosinia. All but the novice Valentina. She's gone to visit her relatives in the village. Now it's clear to me why there was one wreath missing, said the Mother Superior. Suddenly, one nun exclaimed, "Water! Water is seeping in! We shall drown!" Other sisters also began crying out, "What are we to do, Mother? We're afraid." Your prayer shall banish the fear, sisters. Do not be afraid. The Lord Jesus Christ is with us. Sister Joanna, set the tone. Let us sing Psalm one hundred thirty-eight. By the rivers of Babylon. The sorrowful words of the song rose above the dark sheet of water. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down. Yea, we wept when we remembered Zion. When the psalm was over, Mother Superior instructed they sing the requiem. Requiem for whom, Mother? Asked the sisters, although they already knew the answer. It is for us, dear sisters, for we are going to our Maker, and He shall lead us to where there is no illness, sighs, and sorrows, but. Eternal life. The sisters sent forth fervent prayers. Cold water was seeping in from all sides. The voices rang out stronger and higher as the water level rose inexorably. God, holy, mighty, holy, mortal, have mercy on us," sang the nuns, no longer alone, but with the angels, bearing their spirits upwards to the Lord in heaven. The barge sank under. The two fishermen, unwitting witnesses to the martyr's death of the sisters, could still hear the singing. Eternal memory. Eternal memory. Eternal memory.
You were listening to a story by Orthodox writer, clergyman Father Nikolai Agafonov, by the Rivers of Babylon, based on real-life events dating to the first years of Soviet power. And there we end another edition of the Christian Message from Moscow, dedicated to Lent. It was prepared by Director Vladimir Diomin, author of the radio adaptation of the story Tatiana Shvitsova, sound engineer Yelena Gashenikova, and your hosts Svetlana Yekimenko and Pavel Novichkov. Until we meet again, same time next week. All the best. God save you all.